Hi everyone and welcome back to Warno. Today we're stepping away from casting just for a brief moment and we're going to have a little look at unit types in the game. This is more of something for people new to the game, people who maybe haven't played a Eugen game before and certainly people who've maybe come to the channel and have been watching the Gamma videos but are curious what Warno is all about and what I'm blabbering on about when I do my casting videos. It's certainly the case that some people are clicking on those, having a watch and probably not understanding what I'm on about. So I, I apologize for that because it's been a long time since I've actually done any tutorial videos for Warno. Main reason for that is I was waiting for the final release when I would obviously make quite a few. But one thing that's not going to change and I think is important to understand are unit roles. And the armory here is the place to show that off. The armory is a fantastic tool itself because it allows you to filter all of the units with very specific, in some cases, uh, criteria. And otherwise, you can look at specific divisions, the nations, the alliance and everything else. So my plan for today is not too long a video. And it's a video that's going to focus on roles of unit groups rather than individual units in detail. So when we do a deck build, we generally talk in a lot more detail on the channel, whereas here we're just going to sort of briefly brush over all the unit types so that anyone new can have a quick look at this and use it as a quick reference guide to have an understanding of what I might be talking about or indeed what they might be thinking about putting in their deck that they're building themselves in game. So we're going to focus on filter by role today. This is what you would usually see when you're building a deck. The logistics, infantry, artillery, tank, recon, anti-air, helicopters and air tap. But today we're going to focus on the roles. And these roles may appear in various tabs. Generally, the role does relate to these tabs as well. But there's a little bit of variation there. So, first thing we're going to click on is command unit. Units specialize in capturing or contesting enemy controlled areas. So command units to me are the most important units in the game. Command units are how you win the game, basically. Without them, you can't technically win. I mean, you could if you completely annihilated your enemy's forces, but realistically, you kind of need command units to win a game overall. Command units allow you to capture zones on the map. Each map has various capture zones. I'll be putting them on the screen now so you can have a little look at what they look like. In conquest mode, these give victory points and various amounts. So the ones in the center may often give more than the ones further back or vice versa, depending on the design. But controlling these yourself means that you get those victory points every 1.5 seconds. If your enemy also has a command vehicle in there, then neither of you get any points. You have to have more points overall to be gaining any. So if you and your opponent both have a point that gives you three each, then neither of you get any victory points. If you then capture one that gives you another two, you will get two victory points every 1.5 seconds. That's conquest mode in a nutshell. Destruction mode is slightly different. It's still very important to hold these capture zones. However, the capture zones do not give you victory points. They give you spending points. So they give you money effectively to spend on bringing in more units. To get victory points in destruction mode, you have to destroy enemy units. And indeed, they destroy yours to get their victory points. If you destroy an opponent's tank that is worth 300 points, you will get 300 victory points. So to get more units in after you lose them, you need to control zones on the map. And some of those zones are worth a lot of cash income. So command units, very, very important for winning a game. Very, very important for holding on to those zones. The other thing that command units can do is boost the units around them in veterancy. The game has a veterancy system which starts from untrained, then trained, veteran and elite effectively. The command unit can boost any unit to the next veterancy level, obviously up to the maximum veterancy of elite. You cannot go beyond that. However, that means that if you have lots of veteran tanks, 
you can bring a command vehicle or infantry or other command tank near them and boost them up to elite. Beneficial in that it gives lots of bonuses such as accuracy, fire rate, things like that. Now, commands come in various forms. You get command infantry, you get command vehicles, which can range anywhere from a Humvee or a Jeep all the way up to a tank. And you also get command helicopters. Command helicopters, obviously, at significant risk of getting shot down if you get them near the front lines. But there are lots of different commands in the game. And it's always wise to have plenty of them because they are a prime target for your opponent. I mean, why wouldn't you destroy your opponent's command that is giving them victory points and thus letting them win the game? So next up, let's talk about supply vehicles. They're exactly what they say on the tin. They resupply ammunition, they resupply fuel, and they repair vehicles. And as for infantry, they resupply them, and they will also provide new infantry squad members. So if you lose half your infantry squad, the supply vehicle will utilize its supply volume to replenish those squad members. It's a video game, don't think about it too hard. These come in a variety of forms. They can be a Jeep, a truck, a armored vehicle, or indeed a helicopter. Um, and they carry various amounts of supply and that is generally reflected in their price. Obviously, some are gonna be better on the front lines than others. If you bring a chopper near the front line, the enemy air defense might shoot it down. However, choppers would be very good for, say, rearming artillery support and things like that at the back. Whereas you might want an M113A2 supply vehicle up at the front because it's got a bit of armor. Next up are infantry. So infantry squads are your general squads that are about 10 men in size with some variation there between. And these guys will usually have, you know, a rifle set, a machine gun or two, and some kind of anti-tank. There are variations therein though, some of them, for example, down here, the SAS, they have rifles, anti-tank and anti-air. And then some of them, like the reservists of the French, just have some SMGs, a few rifles and a machine gun. They don't have any anti-tank. But generally speaking, you know, they will have machine guns, rifles and some kind of anti-tank weapon. In general, these are your mainstay infantry. Effectively, these are these are what you're going to be fighting the war with. Next to those, you have infantry groups. These are infantry squads, but half the size, effectively, and usually are more specialised. A good example of this is a fire team dragon. Although you will get full size squads that have dragon launchers, which are sort of medium range anti tank, 1,500 meters, you will also get these half man squads which are half the cost so they're a cheaper way to bring in dragons and again fire team dragons down here or perhaps you've got a spetsnaz team here which have lots of rpg 29s but not much in the way of anything but submachine guns and then you've got military police squads which again are five man squads but they have recoilless rifles so medium range anti-vehicle and then you have Oh, just as an example, a gun group here. So a gun group are a four-man squad, and they're basically aimed at having machine guns. So they get two rifles and two machine guns, and they're basically a fire support squad. So these squads, half the size, fulfilling slightly more specialised roles than a full infantry squad for significantly less cost. If you imagine a 10-man variant of this with a launcher would probably cost you more like 70 or 80 points whereas this will only cost you 20. Then in terms of infantry, we also have assault squads and assault groups. Now I'm selecting both of these at once because really for me, they fulfill the same role. The only difference is the squad size, I suppose, but really here, it doesn't make as much of a difference. So these are a mixture of assault engineers, shall we say, with satchel charges. So satchel charges, very short range at 150 meters. They are like a big, big grenade that will, you know, instantly wipe out some infantry squads, certainly infantry groups, and a couple of hits will probably kill even the biggest infantry squads in strength. So a 10-man squad will die probably with two hits from a satchel charge. 
they are really powerful and generally you will see players run away from these squads with their own infantry because of how much destruction they can bring but the penalty is you have to get them very close to the enemy on the other hand you also have flamethrower troops you have standard flamethrowers which are your gas canister on the back and a flamethrowing gun they are obviously very world war ii-esque you will remember those from many a world war ii movie i'm sure then there are slightly more advanced ones such as the sapri rpos which have a flame launcher so to speak and the americans also have their own variation of that the engineers flash which have the flash launcher which you can see on the back of this guy here again a long range flame launcher for anti-infantry and then the Germans have the Pioneer Flams, which have a hand flam patron, and this is very similarly a longer range anti-infantry weapon. It's basically a flamethrowing shotgun. They did exist, by the way. I've seen one in a museum. Now, moving on from infantry, we are on to the artillery or support units. So the first of these are the mortars. They come in a range of sizes. They come from ones that are carried around by infantry, such as this, to ones that are self-propelled, such as the Vasilek, which is actually just strapped to the top of an armoured vehicle, or the Nona, which is a self-proclaimed little tank almost, and indeed can be used as a tank gun by uh, lowering its gun to this level, or it can fire up in the air like a mortar. And then you have your more standard armored vehicles with a mortar in the back that would just fire up in the air now they come in a range of sizes but primarily their job is the same they cause stress some damage and are very good at smoking smoking is very good when you are assaulting enemy positions it's not used quite as much in warno as it was in some of you gents previous games but i think it's something we'll see used more and more as the months go by but basically these are used as harassment and they are very inaccurate but they are good at causing stress and some damage to infantry more than anything else they're certainly not going to do a huge amount of damage to any armored vehicles other than mortars you also have howitzers now howitzers are your more standard artillery they're your mainstay they do quite a lot of damage and they can indeed do damage to vehicles if they get a good hit on top of them, including tanks. Now, these will do a lot of splash damage, they will cause a lot of stress, and they tend to be fairly accurate. Now, these range in sizes from something like 122mm all the way up to 202mm for some of the American ones. Now, these again can be towed, or they can come as self-propelled artillery. Either way, they do a similar amount of damage and they have similar fire rates. You will tend to find the larger ones fire slower, so the 202 millimeters ones will fire pretty darn slow, whereas the smaller ones will fire a lot faster. So you'll notice the 122 millimeter, eight rounds per minute. The 155, five rounds per minute. And then if we find one of the really big ones, down here the m110s with the 203 millimeters that fires two per minute now the big difference is that the bigger they are the more accurate they tend to be and if you can imagine one of these shells raining down in your tank your tank is probably going to die or at least sustain some severe damage if it gets a direct hit other than the howitzers there are also the multiple rocket launch systems now these tend to have lower accuracy and tend to do less damage except in a few cases the grads are very inaccurate and tend to just do more harassment than specifically damage they are very good at stunning and panicking units Urgan is a much bigger rocket these do a lot more damage he is 3.3 these will kill units, they will do lots of damage to infantry, but again, they are not particularly accurate and they just cover an area. The Smirch similarly is technically anti-tank or anti-vehicle because it has penetration rather than HE damage and just covers a wide area. The Buratino, probably the strongest in the game, this is basically a flame-throwing vehicle. 
and this does quite a lot of damage over a slightly tighter area than some of the other multiple rocket launch systems but has a much shorter range of just 3,500 meters but can be devastating to infantry and vehicles alike. Next up are the infantry fighting vehicles. Now these come in a wide variety and can be anything from lightly armored to heavily armored. They can have tracks or they can have wheels and some of them will have tank guns, some of them will have launchers, some of them will have anti-air guns like the Schrizet here which is literally just an anti-air gun strapped to the top of a armored vehicle again. They're very good at doing this, the Soviets. Or you've got things like the Bradley, which is probably a lot more commonly known to people who've played various games and watched various movies. Obviously, this has an autocannon and a long-range anti-tank missile system, namely the Tow 2 here. And then you've got things like the VAB, which just are wheeled, a little bit faster, less armored, and have an autocannon on top. So these are more often than not what you will bring your infantry in. Uh, you will also bring them in in cheap vehicles that you can sell, such as, you know, basic trucks. But these are what you will use if you want them to have some kind of fire support along with them. BMP-3, for example, very strong unit. It has a tank gun, an autocannon, and anti-tank missiles. But it's expensive at 60 points. Next up, we have the mainstay of any battle, the tanks. So tanks are very strong um, in many games. Uh, they have a lot of armor, generally, and especially the bigger ones rather than the little ones. If we go up to, like, a Leopard 2A4, 20 front armor, 10 side armor, rear is 4 and top is 3. Obviously, a very powerful cannon and a machine gun. They come at an extreme cost, 315 points in this case. And as you go down, they have less armor and generally less powerful guns. But, you know, you've got the Abrams there. And again, something that everyone will know. Most tanks are anti-tank, but there are a few in the game which are anti-infantry. Let's see if we can find one. There we go. So the M728 CEV, this is basically a big anti-infantry gun. It does a huge amount of HE damage rather than penetration. It's very good at launching a huge explosive shell, basically. It's almost like having a mortar and firing it in the face of enemy infantry. Just got a reasonable range there. You'll notice the barrel is obviously very short. In fact, it says Top Gun on that barrel. I've never noticed that before. And there are a few like that. The uh, British also have one. Uh, there it is, the Centurion AVRE. Again, shorter barrel, quite long range, large amount of HE damage. Next up are recon units, which come in a, again, big variety. So you'll have anything from a little wheeled vehicle up to bigger armored tracked vehicles. Indeed, things that are almost tanks and also helicopters and infantry. The mainstay of most recon teams are the infantry because they are exceptional in their stealth generally and they have very good optics. Where vehicles generally aren't as stealthy, so can't get as close to the enemy lines, and most of the time will only have good or very good optics. And very good tends to be rare. There are some, such as the Green Archer, or the Fuchs Razit, or indeed the BRM-1 with radar dishes. These units with radar dishes have exceptional optics. There are also a few choppers with that, such as the Kiowa and the Kiowa WR, which has Hellfire missiles. Other than that, most of the choppers have very good optics. A couple of them will again have exceptional, such as the MI-8MTA. Infantry have exceptional stealth and very good optics. I'm not going to go into recon ranges and everything like that in this video and i expect they're going to continue undergoing some changes in this game to tie them down but the better the optics the more you can see the better the stealth the less the enemy can see let's keep it that simple for the moment okay so we've covered all of the basic stuff all the way down to recon 
Beyond that, these roles get a little bit muddled for me. They bring in too many different units. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize these buttons up here to go through anti-air helicopters and aircraft. And then I'm going to pick out a few other things to mention at the end. So let's click on anti-air up here. So anti-air is exactly what it says on the tin. It is your anti-air forces on the ground. So these can be anything from man pads with, for example, stingers or indeed iglers or javelins in the case of the British. Yes, there are anti-air javelins for those who didn't realize. There are also various guns which can come as towed or indeed they can be mounted on a vehicle like the AMX-13. And then there are your missile units that come tracked such as the Strela. And of course you have things which are multi-role with missiles and guns like the Tunguska. And then you have your big anti-air missiles such as the Cub or the Buck. These obviously primarily designed to take out aircraft rather than helicopters. So they have a variety of roles. Some will have better range against helicopters. Some will have better range against aircraft. Some will be radar, which means they can be targeted by enemy seed missiles. These are missiles that seek out radar signals. And some of them will just be guns that are aimed by the user and don't use radar to assist with their launches. Or indeed with the missiles, they will be infrared and target lock heat signatures rather than trying to target lock a radar signature. Helicopters cover a multitude of roles, anything from transporting infantry into the map and acting basically as a, indeed a transport helicopter. And some of them will be coming in with weaponry. So for example, although this UH-1D comes in with machine guns and obviously can do a little bit of damage, you then have things like the Heavy Hog, which has multiple launches. You have the Cobra, which again has many, many rockets. And you have things like the Tow Cobra, which has some rockets and some tow missiles for anti-tank use. The Apache, obviously, with Hellfire missiles, a very strong anti-tank weapon. You've got Little Birds with a couple of rockets. And you've got big things like a Chinook for transport. There's a wide variety here. This one, obviously, a transport rather than a supply. But there is a supply variant of this in the Logistics tab. Obviously, on the other side, you have things like the Akula, again, with anti-tank missiles and rocket pods and a big cannon on the bottom. After helicopters, you have aircraft, which, again, are multiple roles. You've got anything from them covering HE bombing all the way up to cluster bombing, which is anti-tank in this game or anti-vehicle. You've got napalm bombers, which is a bit of anti-everything and does a lot of damage. You've got anti-tank. You've got laser guided bombs which are obviously very accurate and do a lot of damage and then you've got the mainstay such as the f-15c eagle which is focused on anti-air and carries a lot of aim 120 aram long range missile but that is basically the variety of jets you get Last but not least, sorry, I failed to mention is the seed. So you will note that I mentioned that there are some missiles which target enemy radar anti-air, and this is them. The AGM-88 Harm Missile. These are designed to launch and track enemy radar systems on the ground and basically destroy them. So your enemy will use these to take out your air defences. And a little bit of micromanaging is sometimes needed to turn them on and off and move them about and things to stop these guys being quite so much of a threat. So now earlier on there were three things I didn't really want to click on, which was support, anti-tank and transport. Transport is pretty simple. Transport is just transport vehicles or choppers. And these are usually without armaments. So they don't usually have any weapons, as you can see here, some of them do. But most of these can be sold back if they don't have a weapon on them so the ones with weapons generally you can't sell but the ones without any weapons you can sell them back and get the points back so that's transports 
support is a bit of a mishmash of everything the reality is where support is important is actually infantry so if i select infantry and then support you'll see that this ties us down a little bit more to machine gun squads which are very good at suppressing and killing infantry from buildings or tree lines and they have a longer range than most infantry squads there's also automatic grenade launcher squads which again are anti-infantry and have a reasonable range and they can be on both sides so you know the soviets and nato get both there are also a couple of vehicles here to notice which are the spg vehicle and a vehicle with a grenade launcher nothing special but you get the idea there are also some anti-tank infantry which i hadn't shown you earlier these are anti-tank missile troops so ones that have a tor 2 launcher or a conquers launcher or a milan 2 launcher for example and there are some with spg 9s which are recoilless rifles or the wombat from the british or the m40 so various different recoilless rifles and long-range missiles now that's not the only place there are anti-tank units there are also anti-tank units in obviously aircraft and helicopters there are also some vehicles which are anti-tank units so if i deselect or if i go to select all and then i select anti-tank you'll see all this stuff comes up well i really wanted to show off one more that there are humvees and there are these vehicles which appear in the tank tab usually which are like the sure term they have long-range cock on missiles there's the striker with swing fire missiles there's the british version of the striker with swing fire um, there's a jaguar 2 with tow 2 missiles you get the idea there are also vehicles that fulfill the role of anti-tank a little jeep with a milan 2 on it there are also a few random guns which are towed guns that are still anti-tank something that is perhaps from a previous era but they are available in the game i'm just showing these off because these are a bit muddled as you can see these tabs just have too much stuff in um, and yes it's true that all of these fulfill the role of anti-tank but there's just a bit much there and i feel it's too confusing so I wanted to utilize those more just to show off the anti-tank infantry and the anti-tank vehicles. So just bear in mind they exist as well. But to better understand all of these units, you're best off watching the deck build videos for each of the different divisions. And I'll be doing updated ones of those soon once the game releases. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope this was helpful. As I say, it is a general, a very general and basic guide to the roles of various units in the game rather than some in-depth review of these units and how effective they are thanks again for watching and i'll see you all soon